think one of the things that I like to say about myself very quickly is, you know, who I am and, and where I grew up, because it's very um, sort of germane to this book. So before I talk about um, the book, American Refuge, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about the program, um, Every Campus of Refuge. So as Stephanie said, I was born in Jordan to uh, Palestinian parents and grandparents. And it was a, you know, a lovely childhood. Um, but, you know, as the daughter and granddaughter of refugees, really a lot of the stories and narratives that I grew up with and on um, were the narratives of longing and yearning um, that especially my grandmother felt very deeply. So until her last day, she was hoping, wishing to go back to Palestine and be with the rest of her family. And even though we really crossed the river into a country that's same language, almost the same food, um, they still felt very much out of place. Um, and then I came to the US um, as a graduate student um, in 96. And of course, September 11th happened. And for many of us, all of us, life really changed. And, and for me too, and I decided to return to Jordan. I was teaching in Jordan for a while and I came back to the US to North Carolina for the Gilbert College job. Gilbert is a small Quaker school in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I currently teach. Um, in 2015, I was minding my business as an English professor. Olivia here can attest to that. You know, just assigning books and hoping that the students are reading them and going to class and having wonderful conversations about them. And, um, you know, then of course, Syria exploded. And, you know, we all know that the refugee crisis is, is ongoing. Right? It's not the first time that there are refugees. In fact, there's been, you know, refugees displaced individuals, um, you know, for many, many uh, years. But um, in 2015, this, uh, at the height of the, the Syrian refugee crisis, um, we were, uh, I think, heartbroken um, when we saw that picture of the little boy, Aylan Kurdi, who had drowned, trying to escape with his um, mother and brother. And there was something about that image that really touched people in ways that all the statistics, all the horror that was described to us did not. There was something particularly moving about that image. Um, and at the time, you know, we were all struggling with what we can do, how we can do it. And Pope Francis called on every parish in Europe to host a refugee family. And I was really inspired by that call for radical hospitality. He was calling on small communities to do the work of welcome to embrace the stranger, embrace the other. And it didn't take me very long to like connect the dots about parishes and small communities and colleges and universities. Like the colleges and universities are very much small communities, cities unto themselves with all the resources that one can need, right? And in fact, we do this all the time. We host people, we host students. Why couldn't we do the same for um, a family? Um, and so in 2015, I brought this idea forward to the president of Guilford College, and she was in full approval. And so we actually started hosting refugees on Guilford's campus um, in 2016. So we've been hosting refugees uh, on Guilford's campus for the last um, seven years. So this book is really very much, for me, the story of, of that, of Greensboro in many ways, and it's welcome for refugees. And it details the stories of my own mother, my grandmother, who were both Palestinian refugees and, and displaced to Jordan, and six individuals who participated in the Every Campus a Refuge program at Milford College. Um, their names are Ali, Marwa, Bili, Blaze, um, Cheps. Um, and I want to point out, and if you have your book, I'd love for you to look at it because I want us to admire it together. Um, so the cover is actually designed by Ali. So Ali was hosted on our campus in 2017. He's an Iraqi artist and calligraphist, and I'll read about him in a, in a little bit. Um, and he's an incredible artist, and I, I asked him to create Lady Liberty for me. And this is what he did, and it says Lajib, which is refugee in Arabic, so that's the red in there. And I really love, I love this image because it represents for me kind of the promise of America and what it could be and what, you know, what we can make it be together, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, especially um, proud of it, and um, and hope that you can, um, when you buy the book, um, really um, sort of look at this piece and 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 imagine the 
enriching talent that so many refugees bring with them um, to this country. Sadly, Ali, like many refugees, um, works uh, at Tyson cutting chicken. And so obviously he's underemployed, um, even though he has immense skills and immense um, talents. So these people um, whose stories are represented here, um, I knew them very well. So these are folks that I've worked with closely. And I knew those stories intimately. Um, and so when I came to write this book, and I, I'll stop here to say that I was actually asked to write this book by a publisher. So this very rarely happens. <laughs> but a publisher reached out to me and said, well, we want a book on the refugee experience, and we want it to be grounded in narrative and story, not in argument. And they had looked around, I guess, and found me, which is really lovely. <laughs> and so I accepted the assignment. And, um, and but the, the creation of the book was, was really up to me. And I thought about these stories that I had heard, but they were shared with me in privacy, obviously. And so when, I, when it came time to, to write the book, I, I reached out even to my mother and interviewed folks officially for this book. And it was a really remarkable experience because um, as I anticipated, um, they would say, I know you know this, but don't share it. Mm -hmm. Don't say it in the book. And so it was, you know, that was very important that the, the style of the book, and I hope you, when you, when you hear me read some passages out loud or when you read it yourself, the cadence, the style is really reflective of their cadence and their style of speaking. I hope to capture their idiomatic expressions. I interviewed several people in Arabic and I really wanted to sort of harness the spirit of the Arabic language in the text. And so there are some phrases that make you like pause a little bit, but that's unusual. What's that word? Um, in fact, the copy editor uh, at some point pointed out a word and said, is that what you mean? Yes, it is what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's odd, but that's the word that I want. Um, and so really, the, in many ways, these stories represent how they wanted their stories um, to be told. So I hope you can listen for that um, in, in, the, in the pieces that I select. Um, so I wrote this book because I was asked to write this book, obviously, but I also wrote it because as a, as a professor who teaches many things, um, but refugee and immigrant literature, it was really challenging for me to find books that represented the holistic experience of people who seek safety and security. Usually the stories that we get are very painful and they're sort of post. What happens to people at that moment of rupture, that moment of conflict that makes them leave a place that they love and then what it's like in a refugee camp and i really wanted the stories of the fullness of people's lives what it was like to live in a home that they loved right what it was like to lose that home and then to have that moment of rupture what it was like to live in a camp and then what it was like to resettle because resettlement is there is a honeymoon phase there is actually a term for the first three months of resettlement which is the honeymoon phase but after that looks very different from what we expect or anticipate the refugee resettlement you know, um, to look like. So I really wanted to write a narrative that captured that spectrum of the before, during, and after. But the book is organized not with each character separately, but it's sort of broken up into um, you know, all of the before and then all of the during and then all of the after. So it, it was kind of a puzzle for me because, and I, you're a social scientist, so this, you, you, this is not a challenge for you. But as I was listening to those interviews and trying to transcribe them, I'm an English professor. So what we do really is sit in our office and like twiddle our thumbs and read books, right? <laughs> social scientists are used to interviews, and like breaking downs and you know, coding and things like that. And it, that was really a, a lovely challenge for me, trying to break down the interviews into, their, into those puzzle pieces and deciding, oh, this is where I want to break off the story and create suspense. So that was really, um, really fun. And I hope you, you see that. Um, so I wanted to capture that breadth of experience, but in truly individualized ways, right? Not ways that homogenize that experience, but very specific to these individuals. I also wanted to write a book that didn't pander to the spectacle of tragedy. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a professor who teaches black and brown writers about black and brown writers. And the literature that tends to be popular is literature that creates a spectacle of tragic things. Um, and I really wanted a narrative that was grounded in dignity, it was grounded in people's dignity, their agency, um, and that told things plainly in ways that were personal, even if they were painful. I wanted them um, to be plain, sort of plainly spoken. Um, I really didn't want to, these characters to be pitiable creatures because of course they are not. Um, 
And I think most importantly, I wanted to write a book that busted myths about refugees. You would not be surprised to know that over the last few years, many myths about refugees have been fomented in the public narrative, on the news, in the media. Um, and so there are quite, you know, a few of them that are quite damaging. Um, and I wanted to write stories that really countered those myths. So the first very damaging myth is that refugees leave shithole countries. And of course that's not true, right? Refugees leave countries they love, right? They leave homes, they love buildings, they love orchards, they love. And I wanted to capture that. Um, and so um, I'm gonna read to you uh, about Ali, whose artwork graces the cover. And it's on page 30 for those of you who like to follow along or you can just listen to my velvet voice. <laughs> Ali was born in Baghdad in 1971. He is the second of six children, two boys and four girls. His childhood was wonderful, made more wonderful by the women in his life. Like his milk teacher in kindergarten. She was so beautiful, Ali drank the milk she handed out to the children even though he hated it. Her beauty overcame him so that he asked his father to exchange her for his mother. His heart broke when she was gone the next year. Like his neighbor Amna, as a baby, he would wake up early, the first to open his eyes in the house, driving his mother crazy, and he would descend the stairs and crawl to the wall that separated them from the neighbors and call to her, Anna, Anna. Hearing him on the other side of the wall, Amna would ululate as if her groom had arrived, and his mother would lift him over the wall to hand him over to Amna's family. They would play with him all day, Ululating and clapping and singing as if he were a husband handed over from his family to his brides to spend the day. When Amna got married, Ali was so heartbroken, he cried during the entire ceremony. He refused to take a picture with her in her beautiful white dress when she asked him to. A five-year-old lover betrayed. Like his youngest aunt, Ibtisam, who lived with them and was raised by Ali's father, her brother. She took him with her everywhere she went to visit friends, to attend vocational school, to shop at the market, even to clean him in the shower. At night, he slept next to her. When she didn't take him on her service trip, instituted by Saddam for youth to build affordable houses during their summer vacations, and took his older brother instead, his heart was broken. He could not stand being parted from her for that long. A seven-year-old best friend betrayed. Like his grandmother, who in the long tradition of Iraqis, before the war changed the very air and made the trees less frequent than the buildings, would sleep next to him on the roof in the summer. She always came down to sleep indoors in September when the nights were too cold for summer sleeping, but warm enough for the gentle fanning of the lehefa, the fan made from the palm leaves by the woman of the house. The stationary roof beds made of metal and painted to withstand the winter weather were set up in rows a bed for each family member. Every night they were decked with mattresses and pillows brought up from the house. Ali's family had so many members, their roof looked like a barracks with extra beds for summer guests. As soon as the sun set, his grandmother would call him so that together they could spray water on the roof floor to cool it down. By the time the family went to sleep, the beds would be so wet and dewy, they felt cold. He would sleep with his grandmother and aunt on the upper roof, elevated above the lower roof where the rest of the family slept by a flight of stairs. His grandmother's dawn sounds usually woke him, drinking and gurgling with the water from her jug or gulla, making her ablutions for the dawn prayer. Like his mother, who knew and memorized all of the traditional songs sung to children, the songs about Eid, the songs about playing in the streets, the songs about marriage, the songs about birth, the songs about leaving your family, and the songs especially for girls and the songs especially for boys, for one cannot spin the beauty of boys and girls in the same way, in the same song. I'd like to read another section, and this is about Chaps. And Chaps was actually the first guest that we hosted um, at Guilford College. Chaps is from Uganda. 
Chops was born in Uganda in 1990. His mother died when he was five years old. His father had other women, two or three perhaps. And so his grandmother raised him in her lap, in her small house. She was the best of women and life was good with her. In Sabini, she would tell him Chatyangwet, stories, prose poems of lessons meant to build up his life. Sometime in the before, a long, long time ago, all the people would gather together and drink and tell stories about their wealth. One man would say, I have my cow. Another, my four bulls. And yet another, I have my farm. One day, a man who had no wealth wanted to be part of the boasting. I have a hen that always wakes me up in the morning. One of the members pres present you yooed and made fun of him. No one wants to hear about your hen. What are you talking about? People are talking about cows and bulls and farms, and you are talking about your hen? The shamed man kept quiet. He was a poor man who had wanted to feel that he too possessed something that meant something. A something unto which he could gaze and say, this is something big in my life. And so he kept quiet, quit the group, and went to sleep. In the morning, he got up, carried his spear, and walked over to the house of the man who said his hen was too small in the face of all the cows, the bulls, and the farms. The door of the belittler's house, belittler's house, he asked the wife, is your husband still here? Yes, the wife replied, he's still sleeping. And so he walked in and killed him in his sleep, piercing him with his spear until its tip met the ground underneath. Look to the words that come out of your mouth, his grandmother would say. Watch them. At the time, they might look good to you. You may like those words. Your friends may like them. But the person you are talking to, their soul, might be a stranger to you. You never know what kind of person they are. Be with your friends, but learn how to speak. To speak. It will help you in life. Um, and this is a lesson that Chips learns. Um, painfully, um, as he escapes um, Uganda to Kenya. Um, another myth that circulates quite a bit about refugees is that they leave by choice. Now, at the end of this book, there is a whole chapter that has definitions, because we use these definitions interchangeably. Undocumented, migrant, immigrant, documented, refugee. Um, and while movement is a human right, um, there are different legal statuses and that has a different effect on people's experience. Um, and so refugee is a very particular status. You get a refugee designation because you actually prove that you cannot go back to your country of origin. So by definition, a refugee is someone who does not leave by choice. A refugee is someone who leaves by force. Um, and for many, it is a matter of obviously life or death, right? Um, and so I'd like to read um, from Ali's section um, about why Ali left. I mean, Ali, like all of the other folks in this book did not want to leave their homes. Certainly my, my grandmother and mother did not want to leave Palestine. In the late 2000s, Ali worked a very brief time for an American company that provided maintenance for Iraqi vehicles. He typeset schedules, created stamps, and designed business cards. He didn't last long in that job. People working with such companies even if marginally, were constantly threatened and attacked. Ali marginally survived two assassination attempts. The first time, he had been on his way to work while Marwa and their children slept soundly at her parents' home. He casually walked past a fridge on the street on his usual route to his parked car. He absentmindedly noted its presence without surprise. There was always litter, even that big on the streets of Baghdad in those days, the city always disemboweling itself. The bomb left for him in a fridge exploded behind him when he was just a few meters ahead. Had it exploded sooner, had he been closer, he would have been killed, but he was just out of bounds for death. He heard the explosion first and then felt a stinging heat slurp at his back. Shrapnel from the fridge fiercely kissed him in his head and bottom he spent days in the hospital. They removed what they could of the shrapnel, the pieces visibly sticking out, and deflated the hot air caught in his lungs, suffocating him. To do so, they had to insert a tube through his side 
to let out the air as if he were an overblown balloon. The second time, he had been on his way back from work. The first assassination attempt had made him constantly vigilant, suspicious, on the alert about who was in the street with him, behind him, ahead of him, who was walking where and how far away from him. It was his hypervigilance that saved him. On this relatively quiet road, he immediately noticed the car behind him driving too fast as if hell bent on getting something done and out of the way. As soon as he turned to look at the car, he saw the driver stick out his hand. Ali instantly dove. Had he been a few seconds too late in his reaction, he would have been killed. Had his fear not consumed him, he would have not have turned just in time to see the hand, to see the gun, just in time to dive, just in time for the bullet to catch him in the leg and not the chest. The spot where the bullet hit him is gnarly and fleshy now because he was too scared to go to the hospital where he believed he would be exposing himself to more attacks. And so he treated himself at home. The gnarly flesh slowly healed, gnarly and fleshy. And then I quit that job. Um, another myth um, and that was really sort of perpetuated by uh, the previous administration is that refugees are not carefully vetted. So for Syrian refugees, it takes up to five years to be potentially admitted for resettlement. Um, the vetting process is incredibly extensive and exhaustive. And as a refugee, you have to go through a series of interrogations and um, uh, interviews. First, when you present, your, you've escaped and you present yourself at a border, right? you get interviewed. And then the refugee camp, UNHCR, interviews you, and then the resettlement agency, and then the US government. So these constant um, vetting you know, interviews and interrogations um, is really um, traumatic because refugees have to live their persecution over and over again. And what's fascinating about it is that there's this requirement that this origin story be always unchanged, right? That's the point. The point is that you're always telling the same story you're not lying. And so they're trying to catch you in a lie, right? They're trying to make sure that this, this, um, this trauma is real, that it's not fabricated. Um, so for Blaze, for example, it took him 17 years. Um, he was a child when he became a refugee, 13 years old, and um, he wasn't allowed to forget. He wasn't allowed to forget why he became a refugee, right? Um, and that's a, a, a really um, terrible experience that uh, not many of us know about. Um, and so I want to give a couple of examples of that um, because it is illuminating, not just the fact that you have to sort of tell your story over and over again, but what that means for somebody, what the effect of that on a person. So um, this is page 37. And this is from the first time, um, this is the first Syrian family that we hosted on Guildford's campus. That was in 2016. Every agency needs their interview their interrogation, their pound of flesh. When I started working with refugees in 2016, I had not known about this particular requirement, the repeated screening interviews, which necessitate the repeated, unchanging, identical narration of the origin story of why one became a refugee. When we hosted our first Syrian family on Guilford College's campus, I went in those early days of our friendship to visit them. I sat down for tea with the mother, Um Fihmi, in their spacious living room facing the woods. I had come casually in the way of Arabs, and I can't remember what I asked. It was a simple question, polite, harmless, something like, how are you doing? Give had I know now that questions about one's being when asked of a refugee are never simple. Their experiences have taught them that such questions are a test upon which their very futures, their very safety, their very being, about which I was seamless, seemingly harmlessly asking, depends. How were you doing? Um, Fihmi's answer came quickly, easily, and at length. A perfect, flawless, rehearsed, and deeply painful, intimate origin story. The beautiful building in Homs, the plans for more levels on top for the other sons about to get married, then the darkness, the neighbors slaughtered, including the toddlers and the infants, their throats slit, the fear that it was the other neighbors who had done it. She had recognized his voice under the mask when he came around that day, threatening. He used to come over for tea in the before times, unmasked and gunless. 
Then a gas canister exploded in the house. She came out, blackened, and unthinkingly cursed Bashan. The neighbor heard her. She tried to cover up what she said, but knew their days were numbered. The next day, 40 men came, masked, and threatened to kill her entire family. They tried to take her youngest son, Tamir, then 10, because they said he had been at a protest against Bashar. Under the cover of night, they gathered themselves, so many of them, all the sons, all the daughters, all of their husbands and wives and children, and fled. Along the way, a very long journey, they were almost run off the roads by highway bandits, hid in bombed out buildings, nearly lost a baby when in the chaos of an explosion, everybody scattered and her daughter gave her granddaughter quickly to someone else. They found the baby the next day taken care of, but many other children, the children and grandchildren of others, including her own siblings, children and grandchildren were not so lucky. At the end of her recitation, she kept saying that while it was hard, they made it with their honor intact. So many women had been raped, they had narrowly escaped that and were so proud and grateful that they had. What we have tasted, no one has tasted, she told me. I want to read um, also from Cheps because this is, um, I think, a, sort of a surprising, but shouldn't be, um, experience. Um, so Cheps uh, gained refugee status based on um, being an, uh, a gay man, right? So, LGBTQ. Um, and so this is his experience with, with those interviews. When Chups eventually reached Nairobi, he had to tell his story to the UN official. In those interviews, Chups' grandmother's lessons worked. He looked to his words, knew what to say, watched them as they came out of his mouth. The people who interviewed him were strangers to his soul. Within four years, his case was processed. Three of them were spent in Kakuma, one in Nairobi. His roommate, Marcel, however, remains in Kakuma eight years later. Marcel asks friends who have resettled for the money he needs to buy some water cans and some seeds to plant his garden in the camp. He stayed behind because he did not know how to defend himself in those interviews. In the boat with that lion, he was the goat. This is in reference to another story that uh, Chups' grandmother tells him. In the interviews, when they asked Chups about his private life, prodding him to prove his case, he bit down on his dignity, clamped it down so that he could tell them what was painful, shameful, hard for him to say. Where was the whistle now so that instead of the words too hard to say, he can simply breathe out his response to their call. For others like Marcel, who was elderly, and interrogated by a young woman asking questions about his most private life, it is hard to set down one's story, to answer the probing direct questions, to lay oneself bare before a stranger to one's soul. Marcel goes back again and again, hoping, waiting, wishing that the next time he goes, the interviewer will be older, with gray hair like him, and maybe, just maybe, a member of the LGBTQ community with whom he can use the whistle instead of the words that catch in his throat and refuse to come out. So that's a, that for me was a particularly interesting moment where really telling one story as painful as it can be is sometimes not even possible. You know, the, the circumstances are too painful. Um, another um, myth is that refugees resettled. So the numbers here are staggering. There are 86 displaced, there are 86 million I think it's probably gone up by many, many more billions now with Ukraine. Um, but 28 million refugees designated as refugees. And only less than 1% of those will ever resettle. 99% of refugees live forever, their lives and their children's lives in refugee camps. So my parents were really lucky because we ended up in Jordan where we had a pathway to citizenship. Most Palestinian refugees ended up in um, sorry, Lebanon and in Syria, where they still live state, stateless, right? They can't work, they can't go to school, they can't. Um, and so many refugees remain for a long time, for generations in refugee camps, urban and rural. Um, I wanna read from Riri's story. Uh, Riri was actually born in a camp. And it's a, you know, it, it gives you a sense too of how long the lives of camps are. They spring up 
and then they stay for decades, right? We think of them, they're not supposed to be durable solutions, right? It's supposed to be sort of like a pop-up, you know, situation. There's a, this is a place where we can welcome people for a short while and then it's gonna be resolved. And sadly, many of those camps that just popped up have now sort of calcified over the years and they've become shanty towns, right? And it, that's true in Jordan and in many other countries. And this particular case, Tom Hinn camp that I'm gonna read from, um, this is Riri's story, this is page 73. And Riri um, was a student at Guilford College who settled um, in um, North Carolina, first in South Carolina, North Carolina, and um, you know her. And uh, Riri was a um, fantastic, is a fantastic uh, volunteer with every campus of refuge. One does not always become a refugee. Many times one is born a refugee. This is page 73. Riri was born a refugee in Thailand's Tam Hin camp. Her parents fled Burma in 1997, the year Tam Hin was founded. Built for people just like them, sprung up to receive them. She's a year younger than that camp, born just as her parents got there. Their journey out of Burma was long and meandering. One of her older sisters, her mother was in the early days of pregnancy with her when they fled their village in Burma, was born in the jungle during the family's long flight. Two more girls were born in the camp. The last sister, 13 now, was born in the US. When the Burmese soldiers attacked their village, they burned everything down to ashes, including her parents' marriage certificate and family photos. When her family left, they took nothing with them except the baby in their arms and the one in her mother's belly. During the day, they hid and slept. At night, they walked. It was on one of those nights that her sister was born, months after they started their journey. By the, time they got to, by the time they got to the camp, her mother had another child in her belly, Riri. In the camp, the family, family initially slept on the dirt ground inside bamboo walls and plastic tarped houses with logs for corners, something resembling a foundation. But over time, her parents, who were good at designing cut down bamboo, made their house into a plastic tarped castle with two stories and a balcony. And her parents worked hard. Her mother never kept her hair long, even though long hair was prized, a sign of beauty. What use had she for long hair? It was always too hot anyway, and she couldn't do much or work as hard as she needed to with all that heaviness on her head. At camp, Riri went to school like all the other children. Their efforts were put on display for all to see, their successes and their failures. Life's expectations the rituals of pride and shame, the daily concerns that mark everyday existence transpose themselves to camp life. For life in the camp doesn't know any better. It doesn't pause to marvel at its own strangeness, it doesn't falter to wallow in its own existential absurdity. Camp life sticks to its story that life in here is just like life out there. What matters out there matters in here too. In short, life goes on. And at Tom Hinn, education was a matter of public concern. The logic of life there rejected the supposed temporariness, the emergency of camp life and said simply, this is normal life and here we do normal things. So every year, the children's grades would be posted. This was fine until first grade when Rira's grades plummeted because she could not stand her teacher, a cruel woman who would hit the students if they did not study hard enough. The teacher had one unusually cruel form of punishment. When students didn't show up for a tutoring session, she would make them carry classmates on their backs and run five laps around the school. We did not want to be part of this punishment, did not want to burden her peers in this way. When they rounded the building out of sight, she would hop off her classmates' backs and together they would walk the rest of the way until they were in sight of their teacher again, when we would hop, hop back on. For those of us who know we know exactly, like this is exactly who she is. <laughs> I wanted to tell Riri that maybe like your mother, this person insisted on hard work because that was the only way to survive camp life. Not only in the now, where success and the insistence on it could make you feel like you were somewhere else, somewhere where success mattered, made a difference, led to something, but also because it was preparation for a time after leaving the camp, when people in the real world would not be gentle with you or care if you said, but we lived in a camp not the world. We lived in a camp where life stood still because we needed to reflect on its existential absurdity. We lived isolated and imprisoned 
be gentle with us now as we learn how to be in the world again. Beauty left the camp before her teacher did. Now she's the commencement speaker at her college graduation. So obviously this is dated. She's graduated and she's a director of a local community-based organization. <laughs> the first in her family to earn a college degree. Um, and finally, I wanna end on um, another really um, painful myth, which is the myth that uh, refugees uh, receive a lot of support when they come to the United States. <laughs> Um, so I, I tell this because it really is surprising to people to hear that when refugees arrive, they receive a one-time stipend of $1,000. That's it. That's all they get, $1,000. And an expectancy for self-sufficiency within 90 days. So the government expects you in 90 days to become self-sufficient. They give you $1,000 to do it. And, um, and yeah, so within, after 90 days, you're supposed to you know, be able to pay for rent, get a job. And so the, 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 the pressure of accepting the first job is what makes somebody like Ali who's incredibly talented, take that job with Tyson because you need to figure it out fast. Um, refugees also have to pay back the plane ticket that brings them here. So if you're a family of 11, that's about $15,000 that you immediately owe to your resettlement agency. You can pay it back over time. And the idea is that that kind of like builds up your credit so that you can buy things later on. Um, but it is a debt that, you, that they incur as, as soon as they land here. Um, and so, you know, not only is there this myth about resources, but there's also this myth that resettlement equals happiness. And while resettlement equals safety, although not always, right, but mostly safety and security, it does not necessarily mean happiness. A lot of refugees, many refugees are traumatized and they experience a great deal of homesickness, of isolation, of loneliness. Um, so, you know, this lack of belonging, this lack of integration. And so this, it, it, I think it really is, it undermines the refugee resettlement experience when folks who don't know what refugees go through expect refugees to be grateful. Like you're here now, everything's great. And it, it feels weird for a person who's resettled here to say, actually, it's not great because it makes them seem, feel ungrateful when really they're experiencing a great deal of homesickness and, and, and loneliness, especially because many of them have left so many family members behind. So um, I wanted to just end on this um, small section uh, from Mfihmi um, and her life here now in Buffalo um, to illustrate just kind of where she is right now. And so this is on page 121. Unfihmi lives in Buffalo, New York now. Like Jennifer's family who moved from North Carolina to Tennessee, Unfihmi and her family left the state to which they first arrived. Called secondary resettlement, this happens because refugees often cannot find the opportunities they hoped for needed in the location of primary resettlement. Will our migration ever end? Unfihmi asks. Her son, Noor, the only one of her older children who was able to join her from Jordan, works as an Uber driver at night. During the day he sleeps, his depression getting the better of him. Because all of her other children were over the age of 18, their cases were processed separately. And her two other sons and four daughters are still stuck in Madaba, waiting on the refugee resettlement agency to call them, to tell them their time has come to also join their mother and father. In the meantime, they use dwindling food coupons to pay for rent and work odd jobs whenever they can, their own children do not go to school and have forgotten how to write their own names. Umfihmi swears to me that she would have not left her children behind in Jordan had she not needed to leave for two important reasons, her youngest son Tamar's future and her own health. In Jordan, Tamar was missing out on an education and she wanted something better for him, a life of choice and opportunity. And her own body was failing her she needed surgeries and medications, none of which she could access living as a refugee in Magadha. Now she has access to the medical support she needs and Tamar has just started college, but even though she has only seen comfort in the US, her soul is sick. The sight of police officers carrying weapons terrifies her, ties her tongue, paralyzes her body. All she can see in them are those men who broke into her house and homes, masked, guns drawn, pulling away from her, pulling away her son, threatening to kill the entire family as they had done their neighbors. And then there is the guilt that eats away at her. When her son Noor forces her to go out, 
to gaze upon her Lord's face in the beautiful streets and the water, all she can do is look at the beauty and wonder about what right she has to be here, to be watching the ships roll majestically into the harbor when her oldest son, Fihmi, is too depressed to leave his own home. Even during Eid, he is too embarrassed to greet his nieces and nephews and not be able to put his hand in his pocket in the customary way and pull up the idea, the money that tells them that he is their uncle and that Eid is a time of joy and plenty. Instead, he sits at home in Madiba, disappearing into the size of a twig. In Jordan, there are not enough jobs for Jordanians, let alone Syrians. Um, Fihmi and Noor send what they can to their family back in Madaba, but she and her husband are too old and too sick to work, and Noor makes just enough to survive and care for his own wife and three children. She is in her sixth year without them. In the home country, they all lived in the same building, each son and daughter on a different floor. She's in Buffalo, watching the ships roll into the harbor, and her children are living their own death a rented life of fainting bodies under, under fa falling roofs, thousands of miles away in an ancient city with an old mosaic map. I have put my eye in God's eye, for I have nothing in my hands. It is all out of my control. Um, thank you so much. You all have been wonderful. Um, and I'm just, Delighted to be here with you and share these um, excerpts from the book. And I want to leave some time for Q&A. So this is a good time, Stephanie, to take some questions. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so what questions do you have for me? I will start. OK. Uh, and I'll speak slowly so you can think of questions. <laughs> yeah. And just a reminder to the folks at home, you can go ahead and type questions into the YouTube chat or send us an email. Um, so how did you, I know you said that you interviewed people to make sure that you could use their stories, mm -hmm. but I'm picturing that you still perhaps had to narrow, narrow down. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about stories that you, that you might like to have included and, and what that, what that process was like? Yeah. So these really, they were conversations, not so much interviews. So they were very yeah. open-ended and they were very lengthy. Um, and so uh, really I, I just made choices about um, what I thought was you know, compelling. And I really also wanted to capture the stories that um, spoke to a particular memory that they had. And so if they lingered on a particular smell or a particular moment or a particular interaction with someone. Those are the stories that I wanted to, to sort of focus on. And so for Chaps, it was really his grandmother and Marcel. Clearly those relationships were very personal. And I wanted to capture the sort of the, the sensory feelings that, that came um, with those experiences. But I really tried to capture as much as, much as I could of, of their narratives um, and their stories. For me, the challenge wasn't necessarily the selection process. It was really trying to, because when they told their stories, it wasn't chronological, right? So they started at some point and then went back to this other thing over here that was deeply connected to this other thing over there. And so to try to find ways to build an arc um, and not give away certain things at the beginning, um, that, was the, that was the puzzle for me. So it wasn't necessarily selecting, it was reorganizing. That was the challenge. But I really tried to focus on stories that I could tell that were grounded in deep memories for them, and that th those were the memories that that mattered. Um, and that, that the conversations were really very free flowing, and so a lot of it was meandering. Um, but um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, so, Dia, what could you say a little bit about your hopes for the book? Like, yeah. What? Yeah. Thank um, you. So, I think my hope for the book is that. Um, I think it's a book that, even if you know a lot about the refugee experience, it's still really good stories. And if you don't know anything about the refugee experience, it's really educational. So my hope is that for folks who are um, especially teaching um, courses around refugee experiences, refugee literature, um, political science, whatever, 
that this would be sort of a, a supplemental reading mm. to ground that learning in narrative and in story that's very individualized. And that's really, I, in a way, I wrote a book that I couldn't find when I was looking for books to assign in my refugee and immigrant um, literature classes or the courses around every campus of refuge where we were talking about these big, big things, big political things, big international things. And I wanted to talk about the people, but there were no people, right? Or like this, the, the, or they were too long. And this is <laughs> just the right size. <laughs> so, so I, my hope is that it's the kind of book that somebody can pick up and say, I'd really like to learn more about the refugee experience um, to combat these myths um, that we hear around us all the time, but to do so in a way that's grounded in a particular experience. And also that it would be a book that professors and other teachers could assign to their students as, um, as really illustrative of, of the people that we're talking about when we talk about these big mm -hmm. political things. And for ACAR training maybe? Are you that is a great idea. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, or Guilford Reads. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a question about ECAR. Um, one was, uh, are you seeing a lot of engagement by the students with the program? Because this is just a wonderful opportunity to be exposed to refugees in that population. So that's one. And then the other one is, you know, what, what do you see for the, for the future or the expansion or growth in the other campuses? Yeah. And just, Thank you. Great questions. Um, so I would say that, yes, students are really excited about being able to do something material and meaningful and practical. And ECAR is a very convenient way to do that because the work happens on campus, right? And so many of our students at Guilford, they're coming from out of state. It's transportation is a challenge. So asking them to go into the community on the bus or in a car, um, you know, presents a, a challenge for them. And so being able to literally walk from your dorm to the Ikkar house and do tutoring with the children and the family, it's just a, it's a, it's a deep form of engagement and very place-based because they're doing it on site and they're learning about Greensburg. I would say that obviously like everything else, we were challenged by the pandemic because this is a very physical, interactive experience, but we're seeing the engagement pick up a lot this semester. And I think it's because students are yearning for that sense of community. We've been disconnected for so long and the ability to be part of something that's building a community and building relationships. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing an uptick. The other thing that I'm noticing that I'm really excited about is that w many of our volunteers are um, students of color. Um, and I think for me, typically service learning tends to be, for the longest time at least, very much based in like white students' experience and their ability to, to, to spend time and do things. And so to see students of color engaged, um, I think that's really important for refugee resettlement because there is a division historically that's been built between African-American communities and new newcomer African communities. And so building those bridges between those communities is really important. Um, other campuses, yes, there are 14 other ECAR campuses across the country. And they've increased over the last year because of Afghanistan and because of Ukraine. So I think under the last administration and then under the pandemic, it was really challenging because we were, our refugee resettlement numbers were very low. We were welcoming less than 10,000 refugees a year. And so now with more refugees being welcomed into this country, campuses are you know, realizing that this is an opportunity for them to do something. Um, and I think because of Afghanistan and Ukraine are very different from previous rhetoric around refugees, right? So Af the Afghan evacuees are framed as, you know, understandably as allies. And so even the most conservative institutions were happy to support. And then of course, Ukraine, you know, typically refugees, and I talk about this in the, in the last chapter, are racialized as, you know, black and white from the global south. And then to see, of course, that anybody can become a refugee from any country. Um, so I think that sort of shifted for people, oh, this is what it means to be a refugee. Does it simply mean people who come from particular parts of the world? You know, refugees are from everywhere. So, um, so yes, it's, it, you know, but the, the goal is for every campus. That's why we're called every campus a refugee. Every campus to be a refugee. So um, yes, that's constantly the, the work that we're engaging is trying to spread that word as much as possible.
Yeah, um, you actually almost started to answer my question just now, but um, I was just wondering if you noticed any differences in American reception to displaced Ukrainians versus these mm -hmm. ongoing refugee crises, um, either in policy or just in public opinion, and if so, what you would attribute those differences to? Yeah, so definitely. So yeah. the, the, the racial piece is very important, but Ukraine and Afghanistan are also different in the sense that they're not traditional refugees. So the refugee resettlement program is a very specific kind of program. When refugees arrive, they arrive through a particular process, they receive particular benefits like the $1,000, um, as small as it is, it is a benefit, and insurance, right? But with Afghanistan, for example, those are still considered asylum seekers, right? So they actually have to apply for asylum. There's still the case has to be heard. Um, with Ukraine, um, really, it's they're not coming through the resettlement agency so much as what's called private sponsorship. So individual Americans can sponsor Ukrainians. This is not something you see or have seen for other populations. Um, so yeah, it is it is interesting that, to see the differences in you know particular populations and how the, the laws and the guidelines change um, depending on where people are from and our relationship to the country that they're coming from. I think that's the though. And you know, Ukraine and the political environment around that too. It's not just because it's a, you know, you, it's not because it's just European, but it's because it's in, in war with Russia, right? Like that's an important piece of it, <laughs> yeah. So we have a question from someone at home who's asking if you can tell the audience a little bit about refugee quotas, um, and perhaps, you know, sort of, I, I think maybe just getting at sort of how those work and, and how they shift. Yes, and yes, what that yeah. Means for the refugee experience. And by quotas, do they, do they mean like numbers of refugees? I think I think using the term quotas, they're um, they're getting at the numbers that we decide yeah. can get in. Yeah. Yes, and that's going to happen next week. Yeah. So every October should be in October. There's what's called the presidential determination, and the president of the United States makes a determination on the number of refugees, the cap. Um, and usually that's after consultation with Congress and all other kinds of conversations that look at the international and national landscape. What countries are in trouble? What populations do we need to support? What's going on in the world? So people are feeling fairly confident that the number is going to be 125,000, which is the highest number we've seen under Trump. It, you know, not only I think the last one was 15,000, and we didn't even reach half of that. So 125 doesn't mean that we will resell 125,000. It just means that that's the cap, and the goal is to get there um, to the 125,000. And then, of course, it depends. Then that when when folks are resettled. Um, they go to different parts of this country where there's typically refugee resettlement support. What, I, what we're trying to do with ECAR is build up refugee resettlement support everywhere because campuses are everywhere, right? They're all over this country. They're in places where refugee resettlement doesn't happen. And we want refugee resettlement to happen everywhere because that affects our cap, right? How much housing there is, which is dire, right? How much, so, so we're trying to build the infrastructure by creating other kinds of resettlement sites through campuses. But um, I am always proud to say that North Carolina is number two in refugee resettlement on the Eastern Seaboard, or second to New York. Um, and we're incredibly, you know, it's, it's really wonderful that we, that we receive a large, num large number of share relatively of refugees who arrive in, in this country. But um, the, the, that determination where people go is really dependent on the conversations with the refugee resettlement agencies and the kind of populations that already exist. So the agencies like to support newcomers when they already have an existing population from that country so that folks are coming in into a community. I hope that answers I, I the person's yeah. question. There's, there's, I don't see another message that's saying, oh, no, that's not what I that's meant. That's not what so I meant. Hopefully it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we, uh, any more questions for we're, we're close to the top of the hour. OK. So, but if there's, if there's another. Question from the in store audience, you can take it before we go to signing. I just had one more question. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I saw something about Canada's program, and Canada does use the, they have a secondary pathway for the yeah. like, like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I was just wondering, I think you mentioned it in the book, um, how important the local community kind of grassroots support because yes. if you've worked with the government at all, there's challenges in the government. So that 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 really important piece of yeah. grassroots local community yeah. efforts and, and growing that. Yes, absolutely. So the way that resettlement has happened in this country, it's been professionalized. It's a career. 
resettlement yeah. agencies. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so easy for it to become political because we don't see it. We don't engage in it necessarily as a community. We don't do it. You know, we can volunteer, but you know, the, this now, this explosion of co-sponsorship and private sponsorship and university sponsorship means that communities are bigger stakeholders in refugee resettlement. And if there's one takeaway that I want people to have is that when folks, even, the, even people who know nothing about refugees actually meet refugees, their entire perspective changes. And so it's really important for community members to interact directly with our newcomers because it, it makes it a community issue. It's very, it's a lot harder for someone to say, no, we shouldn't welcome any more Syrians when you've never met Syrians. But when they're your neighbor and you've worked with them, it's much harder for you to say, no, I don't want Muhammad's brother to come here because you've seen how much Muhammad wants his brother to come here. Yeah. We can end there. Yeah. And thank you so much. Yeah, this has been amazing. Yeah. Um, yes. Sir. <laughs>